the <laughs> okay so the presentation um, is non-existent but uh i'll just i'll just i'll just improvise um no but you uh, like it, it was just i mean i think you've been up against it because you lost two team members overnight <laughs> and then and then more today yes they're not. They're they're alive, right? Just, they're all still alive. Um, but, but they're not here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's been a challenge. So. Um, I Um, so we work on mainly anonymization, uh, so we wanted to make sure that there's no uh, names in the documents, no phone numbers, no emails, um, just anything that, uh, yeah, is linked to a person, scrap that. Uh, there were a couple of pre-trained models that we tried using, so we tried using one from uh, Birch, uh, it's a named entity, unusual, <laughs> uncased, so that it didn't like recognize, um, yeah, so we make the distinction between capitalized letters and whatever. Uh, so that one we tried on a random, uh, Set of sentences, and here, yeah, I wish I could show you <laughs> But, um, so here you will see person, I don't know how to open this correctly, but yeah, so this one in the sentence that this is linking to, it has the person, uh, Johan Kasper, which is apparently. A field here in Norway. Um, so we wanted to make sure that those fields remained in the documents because obviously you want field names. Uh, so we tried fine tuning it, we tried feeding it um, a list of all the fields that did not work. So we tried a new approach, which was via the uh, open AI. Um, and we had it a prompt, so we wanted to recognize people. Oh, this was dates and locations, this was something else that we were kind of playing around with emails uh, and phone numbers. Um, then we figured that uh, it recognized a lot of um, company names as names of people, which was annoying, so we fed it a uh, list of all Norwegian companies uh, that might be related to uh, the documents that we were giving it. Um, and then that didn't work because, as you can see here, it's still recognizing all of these companies as people. Uh, that's where we stranded. <laughs> that's <laughs> what we are at now. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> short and sweet presentation. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm sure there are questions, so uh, I'll start with you folks in the middle there. Yeah. So, if but you had more time, what would you do next? Um, I think uh, the next step would be to, because the list that we gave it, um, it's entire company name, so maybe we split it up into separate words. So, um, for example, uh, okay, if we go to It doesn't 
you recognize some of her energy uh, for summer as a company? Probably because we have the entire summer energy more famous as a name. So what I was trying to do now was uh, tell her to also uh, so do not use the following names or parts of these names. But what we could do is like split it up into separate words. So any of those words, if it includes that combinations of those words, then it's good for the list. That is something uh, that we could try now. Um, and then uh, we were mainly focused on the companies now, but um, so I don't know if I have a good example of that. Um, yeah, so that, that's messed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, with your first approach, with the NEA approach, you have noticed a confusion between field name and person name. Did you notice the same with uh, with uh, OpenAI uh, prompting approach? Um, so with the open AI it recognizes <laughs> names as locations um, automatically, so okay. not as persons. Uh, so we can have that problem with open AI. Um, yes. Was it possible to try something like multiple prompts? You know, you prompt the first time to get the list of elements that could be personal data, and then prompt again to say, OK, I have this list. Which of these elements it could be a company or a field to, you know, get some away? Yeah, and then have, you know, a, f a final list of things to, that you may have to change. Yeah, that would be a good one. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, but then, so for example, I just give you an example, Conoco Phillips. Uh, Phillips is actually a surname of. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that was one of the ones that I kept on recognizing as a person. <laughs> yeah, and I guess all the stratigraphical units um, in Norway, where, where there is, you know, uh, Brandt, Cook, <coughs> and um, stuff, yours, and all those things, I guess it's also a challenge because then I guess it's recognized also um, being names as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult uh, yeah. one. So the main issues were just the field names and the company names that just uh, are always. Um, yeah. So like we don't even know if there's a lot of personal information in this because it just is filled with company names and field names. So it's quite hard to, um, yeah, check if you're actually on the right track. Uh, so that was mm -hmm. a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, it's not not just companies and fields. There's like ships that are yeah. all people's names. Yep. There is uh, drilling rigs. There's like also things like references. Yeah. Sort of don't necessarily want to include because that's you know kind of important information. So it's like almost any problem, right? As soon as you start kind of looking at it and trying to decide on rules, you realize, oh, actually, this is super complicated. But um, yeah, I was amazed at how well the uh, chat GPT basically does at Mendes and that sort of thing. It's very straight, but it's kind of, um, it, it would fit in the, the models that are supposed to do this job, but they're just like uh, over enthusiastic basically, way, way too many multiple mm -hmm. Um Awesome, anyway, did a great job with a small team, oh, and never shrinking team, so well done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome, all right then, well, I think we're back here, it's showing up, I turn this around again, I dare turn the sound on in case some kind of horrendous feedback happens, but, um, well, let's try it once. What's the worst? I'm embeddings, that's embeddings. Yeah, I'm trying to share with the oh, okay. um,
<laughs> Is the sound better if uh, it's being talked into the microphone? Yes. Okay. You guys need a microphone, yes. Okay. All right. You're on the screen, Yeah. Yeah. I think it's fresh. <laughs> George, what's the uh, ETA? Um, oh, zero seconds. <laughs> Export as a PDF and put up the PDF. Uh, okay. I mean, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to go through this eventually, probably, right? <coughs> there you go. Sorry about this. Um, it's just a case of 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 just a why does it get fuzzy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Take, take it away whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think we start. Um, we we had some um, experiments in in fine tuning embeddings models, and uh, the first. Um, step we actually did a little bit on data pre-processing because uh, we were thinking of how do we actually get a good uh, data set uh, to fine-tune embeddings uh, models and this is maybe here what we an overview what we what we did and maybe Yeah, so uh, so we got the, the data set. So we've mainly worked on the NPD's uh, discos uh, data set, uh, the big one. So it's about uh, a couple of ten gigabytes, I think. The first thing we did was to just load the data and filter it. And then we went down to about ten percent of the data set. We didn't actually get through the whole data set because it's so big, the models were slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, 
so then we did uh, we ran word counts on the full data set basically how how much is each word can run then we threw out all the words that was used less than 1000 times and then uh, we split the data set into sentences and we ran counts uh, how many times are good words been used in a sentence and if that was less than 20 percent we threw it out then we ended up with a uh, data set of around 1 million words uh, which were they all looked like sentences but we were still struggling with uh, meaningless sentences so most of the sentences that had no meaning without having the kind of where it was in the document so then we used uh, the LLM Okay, yeah, that's so we, we tried this. Uh, yeah, so we used this uh, pre trained classifier from Hugging Face that, that categorizes sentences as being gibberish or not gibberish for some varying degrees. And this actually worked super well. Um, we tried an alternate version of this. Uh, yeah, we tried an, We tried an, Was it on site too? Okay. Yeah, it's not. Uh, we tried an alternate version of this using GPT-4, and then we actually found that the Hugging Face pre-trained gibberish classifier was better. <laughs> so that was a cool result. Uh, I'm kind of skipping around a lot. Uh, yeah, and so then we had this problem where we have this big data set, and then we took this like million sentences down to 200,000 by throwing away stuff that was like slightly gibberish and we're left with just clean, like kind of human looking sentences, which were not perfect, but pretty good. But then, you know, our goal is to try and build a set of embeddings so that we can capture the sort of the domain specific language uh, inside the embeddings. So we get that like semantic knowledge inside our embeddings. But that actually turned out to be uh, quite hard. So we had a trick where we looked for like terms that were popular in a uh, hand-labeled data set that Peter gave us. But um, yeah, we really don't have enough time to talk about all of this. Because we have 30 seconds. And if we go to the model, we use this uh, unsupervised uh, um, uh, em embeddings um, uh, sentence embedder that is uh, uh, based on a sequential denoising autoencoder, but it uh, works with the uh, transformer based model, so it's now called transformer-based sequential denoising autoencoder, and this essentially allows to unsuper uh, to, to kind of um, fine-tune or train um, sequence awesome. embedders. Thank you. <laughs> and that's the result. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, questions for the, uh, for the team. <laughs> I saw you got rid of a lot of words that were four characters and less, but these abbreviations are often, there are often abbreviations on the North Sea that are... Yeah, so we were looking at the sentences that were making sense and for the training. These documents have thousands of sentences or millions of sentences that is very specific to where they are in the document. It's referring to some data set. And they are pretty useless in this embedding workflow. So what is more specific to this use case is to get rid of all of that. Uh, if we had more time, or if you want to do a different kind of database, you want to, to keep more of the metadata so that you know where it's referred to in the document, then it make, might make more sense. Then you need to do that. If not, it's useless. Yeah, please. I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with this uh, embedding. Could you explain a little bit more on what your aim was? Like the yeah. purpose? Embeddings are taking text and turning it into numbers. And the reason that's nice is because if I have two numbers, I can measure how far away they are pretty easily. But if I have two sentences, that, that can be quite hard, right? So good embeddings capture the semantics inside language. So if I say like, I need to go buy dog food, and I have to go buy groceries. Like there's some similarity there, right? So good embeddings, if I take those two sentences and I turn them into vectors and I measure the difference between those two vectors, I'll get something like not terribly far off, but you know, somewhat close. And sentences that have like exactly the same meaning should be like in the same vector space. The problem is, you know, the 
pre-trained models that we have for embeddings are really good at like general language, but they can fail in like domain specific language. And especially when we have like, you know, well IDs, right? Which are kind of very meaningful in this community, but you know, to chat you can mean like nothing basically. So the goal is to make a set of embeddings that can capture that domain specific language. Uh, and that, that can be quite hard. So we tried a like, methodology here where we don't have to label a bunch of uh, data sets by hand. Uh, and yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thank you. Okay. So how did you actually measure the performance and what did you compare mm -hmm. against? Uh, so we compared against the, the blue line here is the, this like SDS uh, standard data set, uh, <laughs> which was used in some reasons. I'm actually not an expert on what it is. And the orange here is uh, some hand curated, I think it was 14, so not very much, but like 14 manually labeled sentence pairs where uh, George, the geologist, uh, took, took a sentence, well, sorry, I don't mean to put it in, but I don't know, yeah, took a sentence and another sentence and then ranked like how similar these are and how dissimilar they are. So the results here, like I can talk through this, but that also takes uh, a few minutes, but we tried a couple of different, like, you know, uh, versions of this model we have with like bigger or smaller data sets, more or less geology specific terms. Um, and I think like the blue line is the baseline models and the orange is us. So like, we're not doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, so the, the blue line is the generic uh, text and the orange is our special domain specific text. Mm -hmm. And then this bottom line is like a really good featuring model. And the second line, uh, two lines is uh, a less good pre-trained model. And then M1 through M7 is our like, sort of experimentation here, building our own version of this uh, and, and trying to see how we can make it better or worse. And sometimes we made it better and sometimes we made it worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, cool. Right, yes. uh, what is M? Is it like a special embedder? Is it? Model one. <laughs> I just called it model one because I didn't have room for real names. We shot this by efficiency. Then the the model is it a transformer? Is it a word vec? The is two it transformers, a... MPNet uh, and BERT, are the ones that we use, which are I think both like fairly common transformer models. We got them from my So for the M is either BERT or. The bottom one is MPNet, and the, the second two is BERT, and then M1 through M7 are like custom models. This is what I call the artifacts. Mm -hmm. Just an index. Sorry. Just <laughs> I mean, you need something to create the embedding. That's what I mean. Yeah, we, we can talk through it if you want. <laughs> okay. yeah. So, what would you have? Do you have a question? One is uh, standard BERT, and the end is. Uh, <laughs> MPNet based, we do it's birds based, but it's, it's a kind of more bigger, more advanced based model. That we okay. Cool. I think that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, so, good job to the team. Thank you for sharing that.
<coughs> Perfect. So, I just have to get rid of warning of our IT department. God. One moment, one moment, one moment. Yeah, it's it's working. It's just our IT department forces us once a week to restart the laptop. Is it now it's gone? Not a presentation. Okay. I'm still sharing. Let's try it again. Okay, well now. And now it's and there we go. Mm -hmm. So we basically, yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? Started? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So we basically used the past two days to design this slide. Um, I think it, it's looking good, isn't it? That's cool. I think that was just a big consultant company paid for this. Uh, it's basically so that the team itself uh, was really diverse. I mean, it was from geologists over GIS experts to data scientists and yeah, it was really flavors from every direction. And as you see here, uh, we ask a chatbot to actually create an image showing us at work in Norway. Now obviously, there's beer involved and a robot, whatever. And I think uh, something flying around. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so what we actually at the very beginning, because um, yeah, coming from business, uh, our aim is actually to provide something to business uh, where they can find oil. And we thought, OK, just straight go into uh, the database or in this case, the vector database and do some yeah, contextualized search on with JetGPT by directly querying the vector database and then actually just asking JetGPT give us some really nice fancy answers. And at the very beginning, we actually thought, OK, go straight into it and yeah, one case find all wells in a certain area and then just come up with all the risks or with all the pressures. Obviously, it completely failed um, because due to the simple reason, I mean, we have been aware of that the vector database was preliminary, but it was just yeah, way too pre preliminary. And that's what we learned as well, that actually all the other groups, because for us or from the data science perspective, the other groups have been very interesting as well, but actually a business told us to straight go into something they could use and so we tried it but it actually failed completely um so what we then actually did we just went to the vector database and scanned it for a single well is it possible with a lot of pre-processing to get any useful information out of it um this was actually the point where we realized that prompt engineering is a thing <laughs> and it's not just searching for something but it's literally you have to come up with all these grammars and whatever you use in language. And then we actually ended up with a few different scenarios or setups where we um, tried to work with the vector database. Uh, one was simply just querying the vector database and then instead of using it directly, putting a regex on top, searching for relevant stuff. And then after this is done, then putting it to ChatGPT to actually do even more cleaning and then do the prompt stuff and get something back. Here are some pros and cons. Um, the same thing, uh, actually using the vector database um, and then just straight give it to JetGPT and actually say clean everything up to kind of internal sentiment analysis uh, and really use just documents of any use and then answer the question. And the last one is actually combining the vector database and the raw data. So just going through the vector database, getting the documents <coughs> of interest, and then using these documents of interest or the sentences out of this to actually then query the raw data. Uh, this was kind of actually working good, but again, it broke down due to the fact that the vector database simply doesn't have all documents covered. Um, the concerns out of this is actually that all these three approaches in combination might work best or will work actually best. Um, and these are actually just the examples. So we actually, for the first case, is, do you see my mouse? Yeah, that's actually just really literally just the human readable text we gave it. And these are the results. And we asked for one particular well, it's for two slash four minus 17. 
drilling problems and then it actually comes up with some drilling problems which are really make sense. That's the second one um, you see as well. These are the documents with more broad problems. And Yes. So questions, questions, yeah. ideas. Yeah, I think what you're trying to do is the uh, is the holy grail, right? I mean, is to uh, is the, I mean, especially on the petrophysical parameters. If we could do that, mm -hmm. that would be a game changer for the whole industry. How far are you from this game changer? <laughs> Very far. <laughs> Very far. <laughs> how it's, complex would that be? Um, I mean, it's actually how how this now is set up. It surprisingly worked good, but it's garbage in, garbage out. I mean, we saw that there's so much more pre-processing, metadata, um, uh, maybe improvement on the OCRing still needed. Because when you look at, when you query the database, the vector database, and you take the data out, even after, after regex and GPT cleaning, there are still some weird combinations inside. And it simply, GPT has a hard life to work with this. Uh, and as well, if you have just single numbers, they just vanish somewhere. And then a number somewhere in the text without context doesn't really tell a thing. Um, but beside this, it was just kind of creepy how efficient GPT actually is in extracting useful information out of even just snippets of text. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And to the petrophysics part, uh, they are mostly in tables and they haven't been really part of the data set. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, working on this, do you think there could be some kind of evaluation <coughs> matrix you can create, which you can just test the results which you're getting? Do you, did you step on that part? Uh, yeah, we thought of, but then we literally just did it manual. I mean, we did it for one or two wells where we looked up um, in the uh, main document. So just really having a look at the report. Mm -hmm. um, this was what we have done in just the documents we we gave to GPT, having a look at them prior to giving it and pre-processing it. Okay. This, that's basically everything. But yeah, you would need to have a curated data set because otherwise uh, you always run into the risk that you have hallucination and you take it for granted. Yeah. 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 Where did, <coughs> excuse me, where did you see the benefit of using the embeddings or the vector database compared to doing this kind of just regex lookup for articles? Uh, I think it was faster. Just it was faster. Yeah. yeah. It's the reason. Uh, actually, what we did as well, um, because we then tapped into the raw data and even the coordinates as well to get a spatial component mm -hmm. from the vector database. <coughs> and yeah, if, if you have always these searches or queries after each other, I mean, you can parallelize and maybe put it on a GPU, then it gets more efficient, but this is out of scope. Any other questions? All good? All right, then. Well, <laughs>
Hi, thanks. Are you good? You can hear me. So we were the team that sat in a room paradise. So we are team paradise and we tackled knowledge graphs. Um, you can go to the next screen. Thank you for the advice. We ended up with 11 people who were interested in knowledge graphs and wanted to tackle it in different ways. So we took the advice to split the group and it ended up splitting quite naturally. So we had a, a group of data scientists, people that had um, good domain knowledge. Just go back one. Sorry. Let's go back one. People with good domain knowledge, lots of um, uh, programming experience and a, a really good blend within the group. But after looking at what we wanted to do and brainstorming a bit, it just fell naturally into two sides. So we decided to tackle the problem from two ends. Uh, one from the user side and the other from actually building the data in the place. <coughs> and uh, what is the knowledge graph? So basically what we're trying to achieve over here is merging the silos so we have different data set is present in like different places so we have discourse reports and other type of reports so we're trying to merge them together as well at the same time we are trying to create a structured graphs out of this unstructured data set and on top we are trying to create some kind of an insight out of these graphs so some kind of a useful information can be achieved from these kind of graphs as well how are we going to make this graph? Thomas is going to explain it to you. We have created two kind of graphs. Thomas, over to you. Okay, so the first uh, thing to know is that <coughs> the knowledge graph to see before and the image before are probably the best kind, you know, when you shima, when you regroup your information by type of information, for, for instance, the well on, on one side, the liturgy on, on the other side, and so on. But the, to get data first and easily, you, you had the first approach that was to use a very fast to create the graph with nodes as documents. So is each node of the graph is a document and the link between, between two documents is, is just uh, an, uh, an idea that the, both documents are semantically um, near one, one, one other. So if there is an edge, the documents are, are quite similar. If not, there is no, 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 no edge between those, these documents. So this was a scientific perspective, and now we're going to dwell into some kind of a simple perspective, how we can create a graph. So what basically is happening is like we're traversing over each sentence. We're trying to find a noun from that sentence, and then we're looking for a verb and then adjacent to that noun. And then we're trying to find another noun. So in a way, we are making a graph like there is a node, there is an edge, and there is a target. As you can see over here as well, these are the cluster of the entire, not the entire data set, but the slice of the data set, because it's, it is a computationally expensive task. And how you try to figure out or retrieve the information from that is there is a cipher language which you can use, which is basically just as simple as an SQL language. So you can use this language to retrieve the information from this kind of graph. You can retrieve the information from different depths. You can go to two level depths. You can go to three level depths and you would be able to find out documents related to this kind of thing. So we uh, prepared a little uh... Live demo, live demo uh, with the uh, scientific approach. So with a, a similarity, uh, a sem semantic similarity between each node, uh, it will load and we will come back when it's loaded. <laughs> okay, let's go. I can tell you what we did. What we did is we, we fed a bunch of documents to GPT-4 and asked it some questions based on those documents and specifically asked it to create questions that combined information and derived information from more than one document. And then we made a set of, of uh, documents. And utilizing the time properly, what we what we can achieve from this particular thing is like in the future, we can create chatbots, we can create smaller data sets, we can create smaller databases, which would be able to traverse really fast on the entire data set itself. The thing... Oh, we don't have Q&A, please. There's questions for the team. So what were your key takeaway or learning from this project? So the key takeaway for, for this particular project, first of all, this particular project can be used in, in a lot of different places. My key approach was what we are doing is like this unstructured data, which is a textual data. We're giving it some kind of a structure. We're, we're 
presenting it in a way which it is easily to traverse over. Like you can easily find information from this kind of a data because once you give it a structure, you can upload it into a database. And the way I showed you the graph, you can easily you know, find your way into different level of information, whatever you're looking for. Just to complete a bit what you said, um, well, the team about Q&A, they, they show us that when you just enter your question and then tell ChatGPT, you use the old documents as you wish, you get some information, but not all the relevant information, some document may be forgotten. What you have here is a way to link document between them beforehand, and therefore when uh, your, your model will find some documents that are relevant, you will feed him the links and it will force him to use the other document that are around it that you make, uh, that you linked to, to, to it. And therefore, this documentation will be taken. For instance, if you, if you find a document on the well and you link it to the liturgy, therefore the liturgy will be used in the answer, and which may not be taken if you just ask the question as a, in the prompt. If you want, we can make a live demo. Good question. If on the edge you are at uh, semantic proximity, finally, what's the difference with an embedding? Because embedding will, will do the same thing, will compare documents by their semantics. So what's the advantage of a graph approach Which, against uh, an embedding? This is exactly what I said, this is not the good uh, solution. But we, do, we did this to have some data and be able to run the whole process, the whole workflow, and see if you had answers. The, the good way to do this is to use the model that the other that the, the other half of the team develops, the one that he presents, with the known and the verb that give you another way to link documents together. And then you yeah. find some answer, and the links give you new uh, new documents okay. that you would not have found. Mm -hmm. What we did is just a way to have, as you see, there lots of documents, just something like three thousand documents, twenty uh, k links, and so on, which give us, you know, some food for the for the computations. But was not the the real way to do it. And to add further upon it, in a way you can make sure that the model you're creating is not hallucinating because we're not going into the vector space. There are words, there is a relationship which is a word, and there is a target word as well. Yeah, right. Thank you. We have yep. one more minute. <laughs> I guess one question is, yeah, what's going on? on <laughs> I just asked a question, so they found a bunch of documents, uh, three documents for the moment, because we just set a limit. The question was, considering the depths at which the VHA hashtag 8 experienced firm resistance and the depth range of the high quality measure source rock for all generation, what implication might this have for the drilling strategy and the potential for all discovery in the well? Uh, uh, so. so so we're forcing it to find implications on from different documents or different wells that are completely unrelated. So what we did was uh, eating the graph with the uh, closest uh, node, so semantic, uh, semantically speaking, with the query, we found a bunch of documents that are being used by the model to generate an answer, and uh, his answer was. Uh, given the death at which the encoder frame resistance, the frame resistance, well, can you read it? Uh, given the depth at which the BHA number eight encountered firm resistance, 3,502 meters, and the depth range of the high quality mature source rocks for oil um, generation, it implies that the drilling strategy may need to be adjusted. The firm resistance encounter could indicate a change in the type of structure potentially leading to drilling challenges, etc. So you get a GBT4 clean a uh, derived response with a with a um, cause and effect. With the citation. Yeah. So we have the documents that it's citing, but it's also been given the context of four or five relevant documents to to uh, connect the different wells or the different depths at that position. Right. Very cool. Thanks for showing that. Cheers. <laughs> Just one last thing. Uh, we make the code uh, available on GitHub if some teams are interested, and if some of you have your code on GitHub, we would be interested too to get it to see what you did. Yes, uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yes. Indeed, if you're able to yes. share what happened. So, it was a question around the data, which, you know, we sort of are not review, because we may clean uh, it more before releasing another version. <laughs> um, I'm sort of inclined.
inclined to think that if it's somewhat discreet <coughs> and not an explicit distribution of the data, then if there's example data in your repo, I think that's fine. Um, but, but maybe just don't include like a folder saying, you know, here's all the data. Um, you know, just remove that from the repo uh, first, perhaps. Um, but I'll let you be, uh, you know, be a responsible judge. Can we touch the data? It's our responsibility now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of. Yeah. 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 Um, do uh, do the license search. Yeah. Um, right. So, last two. Um, well, this is an elaborate way of talking the point, I guess. Uh, and it's the Q and A with the authentic uh, data. Q and A. We trust you. <laughs> welcome, welcome for the questions. So, yeah, so hello, we are the QA generation group, question and answer generation. So, um, yeah, okay, let's just look. Yeah, so we are uh, uh, Henri, which is a technical potato, mm -hmm. he calls himself, and we have Nolven, which is a PhD candidate. And it's Akram, who's a geoscientist, and it's Alexander and me, who's both data engineer slash data scientist. And um, uh, so, why do you want to create questions and answers, you might ask? And the long-term goal is to have a large language model for oil and gas exploration and for the domain knowledge. And it's also helping to uh, progress AI and machine learning. And it could also be used for benchmarking NLP models and can be used to train other large language models to be better for the domain. Uh, so what we did was to generate a benchmark question and answer set, which is inspired by the squad set, which is Stanford question and answers data set, which is used for uh, testing large language models to answer questions based on different data sets. And we used to GPT-4 to create the questions and answers and pairs from the domain text. So this is process. We extracted some text. We use the model to create the pairs. We create a benchmark data set and we run an evaluation script to see how it looked. Uh, so first we created, a, we try to like filter the data a bit to get the, to get smaller chunks of the data instead of like huge pages. Uh, and afterwards we found that uh, Peter has posted uh, some data in the Slack. So we used that. It was very much more clean data than some computer vision data we we originally used. Uh, so Here's the prompt we used, it's a big prompt, and it's uh, it kind of built up like this. We want a question, we give you a Velbor name and some a passage of text. And we want a question, a short answer, a long answer, and a confidence level from zero to one. So that's really for fun, the last one, because you can't write yourself, I guess, for as a chatbot. Uh, so this is an example, this Velbor name and a long paragraph. And this is how the output looked. So it's formatted as a JSON list where each question gave us a set of questions, uh, like up to 10 questions, I think. Uh, so uh, we ran this for 1,100 rows and we made a cost estimation. So we have a, a, some amount of tokens uh, average for each uh, input and output. And then we had a total cost for the entire like set. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, when we got the questions and answers, we get did a check to check if is this actually correct, does it has any good quality, and we uh, manually checked 550 of those pairs, and we found that uh, 450 was of pretty quite high quality, so it's quite impressive, and it was a very low degree of hallucination because it created both the questions and answers only from the text we gave them, so it had many problems with uh, like tables uh, as the string form, and also some like it gave us information about uh, this information is in chapter four, which is not very good. 
Um, and we also had a, yeah. So we had a, we had a script that created a, a data set that we could be used as the, just as a squad model that has to test other large language models to see how they perform. And so some so quick examples, um, how it performed. So here we can see that we get, this is just a part of the paragraph that it used. Uh, so we see what difficulties do you have find here? And it gives us the correct answer in both short, concise form and the more longer natural language form. And also one impressive example, here's actually as a kind of table where you have to find out the position relative to the other things to find the, cor the uh, correlations. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Just a question about uh, the metrics of uh, evaluation. Yeah. Um, is there a similarity matrix or um, summarization matrix or stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that I can reply. So um, there is three metrics. Um, there is okay. F1. Uh, there is what we call exact match. That means the answer given is exactly the same as the one in the data set. And for the long answer, uh, yeah, we don't have the example here, but it's usually a long sentence. So the, it is possible with generative language that is going to be a bit different. So we use a, a metric that is called blue, uh, that is really, uh, it is well used in the field of NLP for like machine translation and things like this. It just computes how close uh, the two texts are. Uh, so then we can we can rate uh, different models as a, in a leaderboard kind of uh, manner. I would like to add a point uh, on that. Uh, it's, we remember that uh, it's also important uh, to construct for the result, to have some human in the loop. Mm -hmm. And so uh, having the possibility to check, uh, as we have done just as we said before, 500 uh, pairs of question and, and, and reply and detect that it's okay and, and go to, as a human feeling it's trustable is as important as measuring an F1 or any other score. Yeah. So, considering the amount of the data which is present over there, how many questions and answers do you th guys think that we would be able to create in order to traverse over the entire data set in order to create a model which is above, let's say, 60% accurate? <coughs> Um, so you asked how much data we could yeah. produce? In person, like how much data you would be needing to create Q and A1 in order to create, because I believe the end goal is to create a model out of it, right? And create Q and A of entire data set so we can easily answer the questions. Yeah, so I don't know the size of the entire data set or how big part of the data set was represented in the clean part. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I don't know. We had... 1,200 rows almost, um, which created, so we could split it up into smaller parts and get more questions out of each, but like the main purpose of this <coughs> is not to like cover the entire database itself, it's just to give like, we want to create questions and answers that mm -hmm. a real model can test against, like to see, does this work, this model? To yeah. create another data set. Yeah, is it like a validation test? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yes. Uh, it's creating a, a the Q, uh, Q and a Q&A system for everything about the about the North Sea. Uh, yes, that's a graph. Uh, there are some long fruits like just creating a benchmark, mm -hmm. uh, and that can be done with five hundred pairs or or, or one thousand, and that yeah. it can be done in a few hours. Mm -hmm. Just to add what we had noticed: if if the paragraph is small, some question he tried to. Re almost repeat the same question by like <laughs> changing a bit of the yeah. phrasing. Mm -hmm. When the paragraph is long, he can try to find more mm -hmm. related question. Also, if he doesn't find the good question, his confidence level kind of decrease mm -hmm. uh, because we output some confidence number from the from the GPT-4. Mm -hmm. So maybe something is to <coughs> put a threshold on this and 
see how much question he can uh, generate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so quite an interesting experiment just to check. Like, we ask it to give itself a confidence level, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time this was it said one, of course, because it's super confident. Mm -hmm. But this was completely wrong. But a lot of times they say like, oh, this was zero point six, and was actually quite not that good. So it's almost like it could be able to like evaluate itself. Mm -hmm. But that's the, take it with a grain of salt because of yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it's done. Uh, yeah. The time is zero. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was, if you have to draw one. No, 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 sorry. Okay, well, good. All right, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, very, very interesting. Again, uh, very long prompt, a uh, lot from the engineering. Um, but it's really cool, I think, outlook to say, yeah, what kind of um, product did you make for the community that will uh, help improve? Or benchmark. Yeah. Uh, yes. So thank you for sharing. Let's spin the wheel uh, one last time to make sure that the <laughs> team is still And it does. Uh, Mess data. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm uh, the last one surviving my group, but we were six in the beginning and uh, everybody came today and everybody helped in the presentation, but um, people left in the, in the end. So we were doing metadata <laughs> classification and it's very much overlapping with the Q&A groups and also the graph a little bit. And it's all new to me. I'm not a data scientist. We were geophysicists, physicists, and we have a couple of data scientists who did most of the work while we were trying to, to learn. So what we considered uh, the problem was to get tons of uh, reports and files where you have a lot of information which is going to be taking ages to go through. And the solution would be then to use a machine learning to summarize docs into different metadata that you, you can automatically extract and populate some kind of uh, database. So an approach could be to take the input data. What we did was use the raw data, uh, raw text in JSON format. We use a a keyword uh, algorithm to extract uh, some uh, keywords and then we filtered most of the keywords based on some scores. I'm going to show some results of that. Plus we added uh, manually some keywords that we wanted uh, to extract and we use uh, the open API to, to extract those keywords from all the text. So the input data was uh, all these uh, documents, 45,000 documents, many, many pages. And so we, we eventually have to filter out like many of you did to get some results to show here. And we ended up with um, all, well, all wells containing one report. It was about 10 wells or at least 15 wells, I think, in the end. So we, we retrieved the data uh, keywords from um, from the documents using this keyword, and also we take some metadata from other Q and A teams. And for example, if the keyword keyword uh, gives something like this, um, you could use one keyword or two keywords. You get a bunch of uh, keywords for every document and for every page. And in this case, we added up all the keywords and their scores to generate something that a histogram of keywords that we can use to as as metadata. But this may need refinement to work, uh, as far as I understood. So we selected some of these keywords. I'm showing here some of them, and then we created uh, a prompt that which we, we've had to chat GPT. The prompt is here and I'm gonna read it. It contains the keywords and uh, what the chat GPT is supposed to do. And then it gives out the result 
for wells and gives the field names, operators, issues encountered on the wells, uh, eventually if the <coughs> equipment failures, petrophysical parameters, uh, and other things. Many times we didn't find the uh, information, for instance, longitude, latitude, and other things, but this can be easily incorporated through other files. So that's it. That's uh, basically what we did. And some perspectives for future work is to feed, the, feed this uh, data extracted into graphs or other things where you can easily search. It may be. <laughs> So, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, please. Same question. Uh, what are the metrics uh, applied for the summarization part? If, if you. Yeah. The metrics to calculate the summarization part? Ah, for the summarization. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what is a matrix for summarization. Uh, to calculate the performance. Uh, ah, yeah. We gave. Uh, we tell. We told ChatGPT to give us a score uh, between zero and one, so we could filter everything that's less than eighty percent, at least zero point eight. So, but um, we tested many times, and the score was different every time. <laughs> <laughs> so we should not trust that much. But as uh, 0.8 was a good number, or below 0.8 started to come garbage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But did you get the result as, uh, as a format of a tab? Like no, we got it as a JSON uh, format I that uh, we read in a script to produce this tab or graphs or whatever mm -hmm. you want uh, later on. So uh, you basically dwelled upon a little bit that uh, this metadata can be used in the knowledge graph. Mm. Do you, can you envision it that uh, from the knowledge graph you can create this data as well? Yeah, I, I saw that uh, probably the approach that you followed is much more thorough. You include much more. Here we are already doing a filtering stage to include only information that we want or that we extract automatically with this keyboard. But uh, much of the, da the data in the document gets a bit lost in that way. Yes. But uh, this was not a very heavy duty work. And so you can train with m m different sets of keywords and not generate that huge data set. <laughs> I don't know what um, this is what we came up in these two days <laughs> iterating back and forth with ideas and I don't know. If this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it has been the other way you would first do the classification and when you have the classification you would try to do a graph on it. To use the all, the all the categories that you have found in the in the database to put your documents in the right columns and then Make things between them to use the, the graph and, and not do the graph and then use it to classify. To, to the, yeah, it can go both ways, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, yeah. First, you classify and then you use it to, to, yeah. to link your document together. You have to do it. Yes. In fact, if you see all the parameters that you add, they all follow one after each other. After that, you first have to clean the data, then to do the right embedding, then to classify it correctly, and then to you know, all, of the, all of the projects are, should have, are based one on, one on the others to, to finally have the good, uh, good models. <coughs> right, yes. Well, anyway, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> One of the things that seems to have come up quite a, quite a bit today is sort of metrics and how you tell the difference between good performance and bad performance. Uh, so that also leads to benchmarks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think also to experimentation. And so hopefully lots of you have sort of caught the bug today of experimenting with machine learning and natural language processing and have some of the tools to sort of go off and compare different methods. And what happens if I do this first versus that first? Or if I emphasize embeddings over knowledge graphs? And um, yeah, I think there's so much scope there for yeah. 
uh, improving what we're capable of doing today. Because I can tell you from, you know, I've been running hackathons since 2013, and if there's one thing that comes up at pretty much every single hackathon, it's how do we get structured information out of this pile of undifferentiated mm. PDFs? Mm. Um, it's a completely, you know, endemic, unsolved problem. And uh, clearly there's a feeling that there's a ton of value uh, to be sort of unlocked there. So I think this is it's time well spent uh, mm. this problem. Uh, so yeah, uh, if we get together and do this again in a year or something, I think it would be really interesting to see how uh, people have managed to mature ideas and maybe publish some benchmarks and uh, what that leads to. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, welcome to the uh, to the club, I guess, and uh, thanks for wanting to be part of it. Um, I hope that uh, we see many of you this evening, and if not, I hope we see you out and out in the community at data science meetups on uh, sharing the cool things you do on LinkedIn and so on. But do stay in communication with each other. We'll keep Slack. The Slack running for a bit. I mean, I don't, you know, it's free, so we don't need to shut it down or anything. Um, as long as it's useful, we'll keep it around. And then maybe we 